Today, we are um, very happy to have with us uh, Dr. Francois Patou coming to us from Lille, France. And um, just a little bit about him. He's a surgery professor at the University of Lille in France, where he heads the Department of General and Endocrine Surgery at Lille University Hospital. He leads a group research group called Translational Research for Diabetes Unit at the same university, which focuses on clinical development of biotherapies for treating diabetes, including cell, cell therapies in, involving human islet transplantation in autologous and allogenic recipients. And he's received grants from national and international institutions, including the Seventh Framework Program, Agency Nationale de la Research, and, Juven and JDRF. Additionally, he's been awarded the Grand Prix of National Academy of Medicine, and with more than 400 peer-reviewed publications in journals such as New England Journal of Medicine, Lancet, Nature, JCI, Cell Metabolism, and Gastroenterology. He's a renowned expert in his field. He's frequently invited to give lectures on biotherapies for diabetes, and he's a principal investigator of several ongoing clinical trials of islet cell transplantations in pancreas with severe type 1 diabetes and metabolic surgery in patients with type 2 diabetes. Welcome, Dr. Patu. I thank you very much for joining us, and it's we're very excited to uh, hear more about uh, your, your your fabulous new paper that just came out in Lancet, The Association of Primary Graft Function and Five-Year Outcomes of Islet Allergenic Transplantation in Type 1 Diabetes, a retrospective multi-center observational cohort study in 1210 patients from Collaborative Islet Transplant Registry. Thanks so much for joining us. Okay, thank you very much, Monica, and thank you for this very kind introduction. So indeed, that's uh, the good opportunity with this paper that came out uh, recently, last week, and you can see the, the, the title, uh, to tell you a little bit about islet transplantation. We've heard a lot about it, but it's uh, it's now real. It is even standard care in many countries worldwide, so it would be a good opportunity to share with you this, uh, this, uh, this new uh, avenue for treatment. So just to, to tell you, there is a lot of people in the, on, the, on, this, on this slide, but just we are a team in Lille, in France, but of course, this is a, a multinational and global uh, initiative. And this is important to cite the Collaborative Islet Transplant Registry, which is an NIH-funded initiative uh, to gather all data from uh, most of patients uh, transplanted with islet transplantation worldwide from uh, the three continents. So uh, this was important for this uh, project. So, OK. So just as an introduction, this is uh, the typical patient that we are seeing as a candidate for islet transplantations for type 1 diabetes, of course. So Valerie on the, on the, on the left is, is the patient. So she, of course, with her husband, accepted to, 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 to be shown here and to tell you a bit more about uh, her, her disease. So she has been diabetes for 47 years, so her whole life. And uh, she has been through uh, many different types of treatment, of course, but as some of the patients, after decades, it becomes more and more difficult to cope with the diabetes with insulin, whatever you're talking about, pumps or anything. So these days, she's really worried because of hypoglycemia. And uh, these severe hypoglycemia, she's not, uh, she's not expecting them. She cannot uh, anticipate. And for her husband, who is with her all these years, it's really fearful because every night is is just you know holding his hand to see if he's sweating because it can happen anytime and it is really threatful. So that's the, the the idea. Just this slide is to tell you there is two goal for this therapy. One is of course get out of the very severe disease with the risk of hypoglycemia, which can be lethal. This is the no hypoglycemia, the blue thing, and this is uh, Mr. Patrick is the one behind this 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 goal. But for her, for the patient, there is also something else. There is something which is called, I would be rid of insulin. I've been living with this insulin thing for decades, since all my life. And one day I will, I will like to win and to get over this disease and be free of insulin. So it's difficult because you have to cope with this behind, behind the scene a goal, even if the number one goal is to be, uh, to be able to, to, to live an acceptable life. Can I okay, ask a so quick that's... question? Can I ask just a oh. very quick question? Um, does she use a Dexcom to try to, or CGM to try to monitor it, or is it just not even even with that technology? It's still she has hypo unawareness, and it's still quite an issue. Okay, so we're not talking about closed loop because I mean uh, the closed loop, fully closed loop, but but CGM for sure. Uh, so this we are talking about few percent of patients with type one diabetes, mostly uh, in their forties, fifties. 
Mm. So it's nothing like the, the common type 1 diabetes, which can for years, decades, go very well with the, with the disease, very well. Right. Diabetes so even okay, with a CGM, she's still having a lot of problems. Yeah, right? yes. and, okay. and of course, multi-injections, most of them have pump, even if not closed loop. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just this is uh, something not, uh, not uh, exceptional. It has been uh, performed everywhere. This is just the last uh, article that did the, the survey of who is transplanting worldwide. You can see uh, all the little dots in the three continents. So there is more than 60 uh, IV transplant program active. Interestingly, it is not standard care everywhere. And in the States, in the USA, it is not reimbursed. We can discuss that yet. So that's, a, that's not the same, same situation everywhere. In France, this has been reimbursed for two years now. Uh, OK, so uh, this is, this is typical, uh, typical islets. So that's the one where we are transplanting. I'm not telling you much about the preparation of the islets, but it's just uh, six hours uh, process starting from an organ donor, from a pancreas, from a harvesting of a multi-organ donor. So that's, uh, of course, the, the, the primary source of islets is, uh, is uh, deceased patients without diabetes, uh, organ donors. This is the islet, so you can see them like little uh, rosemary. So it's one islet is 1,000 islet, 1,000 cells, uh, both beta cells and, and alpha cells. And uh, their, their size is about few, uh, a few fraction of millimeters. So 100 to 500 micron. So you can see them. You'll see them a little bit later. So that's what we are transplanting. So the whole thing, few hundred nilets for one person, is a tip of a finger. It's few milliliters. In the pancreas, you have mostly uh, uh, exocrine tissue. So importantly, we have to understand that these donors are very heterogeneous. They are human donors, so they can be old. They can be. They can be with obesity. They can be from different race, from different sexes. It's very heterogeneous, so we have to be careful of that. The, the source of islets is not perfect. We would love to have this perfect embryonic stem cells factory, and this is something which is ongoing, and we have been uh, seeing that last year. So we in Lille are involved in this multi-center trial, which is for the future, and I will tell you about the present, but just to tell you, to mention the future, there is hope that one day we'll be able to transplant not islets prepared from human donors, but from embryonic stem cells in a must, in a much uh, limited way. But this is just starting. We can discuss that, but this is for the future. But it is, it is near future. Okay, going back to the to the islets. So this is the islets being transplanted. So they are transplanted in the liver through a catheter that is just infusing the islets. You can see them. You can see these little dots in the in the tube. That's the islets. And in 30 minutes, the islets are transplanted in the portal vein, the vein which goes to the liver. In the liver, that's a patient which is very special. So sorry for the surgical picture, but that's a patient that has been transplanted three years before. She's insulin independent, and she had to go for a cholecystectomy. So a simple elective operation, laparoscopy. And she accepted that we took a small piece of the liver, because this is an exceptional situation, to have be able to look at the islets in the liver. So we took this little piece of liver and on the right, you have the histology. So you can see that islets, three years after the transplantation, they are living in the liver, in the portal space, perfectly well. And you have on the bottom, the insulin glucagon staining, red insulin glucagon uh, green. And you can see here that they, this is the shape of an islet. So this is quite an amazing picture where you have a human islet from the donor in a patient, but in the liver. So that's not, of course, uh, classical. But that's where the, where the, where the islets are, are transplanted. There have been many studies to transplant them anywhere in experimental models, but the liver seems to be the, the most efficient uh, site, very well vascularized, easy, easy, not so difficult to access, few complications. So this is the, the result of, of this transplantation. So when you transplant the, the patient, uh, of course, on the left, you have the CGM typical uh, traces of, of these patients. So very irregular, a lot of hypo, a lot of hyper. Of course, you can go better with artificial pancreas with the closed loop, something that is, is, is booming, you know, now. But of course, it's better, but it's far from perfect. And this is upper right. You are better, but you're not perfect with this insulin uh, closed loop system. 
With the islet transplantation, this is natural again. So this is just uh, the standard physiology. So from the same situation before, you can have near normal, not distinguishable from a patient without diabetes after the transplantation. This is the goal of it because the, the islets are perfectly uh, suited for the job. Uh, if they are enough, uh, you can have a normal glucose control. Of course, it's important to tell now that this graft goes with immunosuppression, anti-rejection therapy. So a drug which is quite serious and has also risks. That means that we have to cope with this risk and limit the indications to the patients with sufficient risk in the short term. These are the labile diabetes, the patients like Valérie with very severe forms of diabetes with the risk of, of, of lethality in the very short term. That, justify the risk of immunosuppression. Important to see. Okay, but this is the, this is the highlights, okay? So just obvious, but important to say that the function of the highlights uh, goes with the, with the clinical results, meaning that the more C-peptide, the C-peptide is what you can measure in the circulating blood from the highlights. You know that C-peptide is secreted with insulin, like a twin, but insulin can be from the insulin given, C peptide must come from the islet. So that's a, a proof of insulin secretion, endogenous insulin secretion. So, of course, when the C peptide is going up in these patients, the need for insulin, exogenous insulin, is decreasing. And at some point, you can stop insulin. And um, okay, but this, this is taking us to the, to the heart of the article, which is that. Uh, Importantly, in transplantation, we know from other transplantation, for example, in kidney transplantation, that the early function of the graft, so the, the first day after the transplantation of a kidney, tells you a lot about the long-term outcome, meaning that you have a super graft that works very well in the first days. It's a very good news for the long term, years after, even if you will have immunosuppression, rejection, many, many potential drawbacks on the, on the way. It's very important in, it, and it's proven in kidney transplantation. It's a little bit more difficult in, a, in, a, in, in islet transplantation. And this slide shows you that when you have an islet transplantation, the function, which is this dark line starting from nothing, and you can have a, one first injection, second injection. Often we have to do a second or third injection to have enough function to start with. And we can have this early graft function. And then you have many other things that can happen and decrease the function with time. And at the end of the day, of course, the function is declining. But the question around is, is it important to start with a lot of islets? Or is it more important to, to be careful about the immunosuppression and to avoid rejection or other drawbacks? So this is not very well known. Even if in the kidney uh, in the kidney transplantation we know how important is the early graft function, it was not very well known in islet, where it's not so easy to define. So what we did a long time ago is defining what is called primary or early graft function. And to do that, we have uh, used a, a composite score, which is a mixture of uh, plasma peptide, glucose control. Uh, DKJ hemoglobin, uh, glycemia, and the insulin requirement. Because of course, if you put insulin, the glucose goes down. So you need to have all these ingredients in the equation. So at the end of the day, we have this score that at any time can tell you what is the graph function. And what we define is that one month after the post, after the last infusion of violet, that's what we call primary graph function. So that's the, the metric of the initial function of the graft after the process was, was done. And what we have found is that in our, in our experience, that was a paper a long time, a few years ago, is that uh, you can see on the left that uh, in this series of patients, all patients, or 90, 95% of the patients could finally stop insulin after one, two for most, three injections for some. The three injections were given within six months. But if you look carefully, even in those patients who have stopped insulin, they don't have the same level of function. So you can have, you can have less than perfect function and stop insulin, but your glucose will not be exactly normal. So the idea is you can see on the right that among these 30-something patients, 
you have those who have optimal function, really like normal person, and others who are doing well. They could stop insulin, but they have, let's say, suboptimal primary graph function. Let's say a car with three wheels runs, but maybe not perfect. But what is important is that in our, in our series, 10 years later, we could see a major difference in the outcome, the long-term outcome of, uh, of these patients, if they had super good function to start with or suboptimal function. So, and it goes with the, the function of the graph, so the, the survival of the graph with C-peptide can be measured in the, in the blood, but also for the full function, which is insulin independence. So this is my Christine Vantigam, our, our, our colleague in diabetology, who is taking care of the, of the patients. So that was interesting, but that was an idea. But of course, it was a single center. It was retrospective study, but a single center. So there is many confounding bias, and we don't know if it's really so important to have this primary function. That uh, took us to the, to the paper. So the paper, that, which was uh, Michael Chet in a PhD, was, uh, the, the goal of that was to demonstrate with the right cohort, with the right setting, the impact of this primary graph function on the long-term outcome. So is it very important to optimize the graph function to increase the number of islets we are transplanting, or is it much more important to take care of the immunosuppression or other factors? Uh, some thought that uh, whatever the number or whatever the function we start with, this will not change the end. Uh, we need to work more on immunosuppression. So that was the goal, and for that, we had the chance to be able to, uh, to study the data from this collaborative islet transplant registry I told you about uh, in the beginning, which is uh, this global initiative with more than 1,000 patients. So we started with all patients in the registry, and this is the, the, the paper that was published uh, uh, two weeks ago now. So we started, we very carefully selected the patients to have only the, the right patients, so we all these uh, exotic patients were excluded. But at the end of the day, we had 1,200 recipients of an islet transplantation that were transplanted in the past two decades worldwide. And we could uh, analyze the question in this group of patients. So this is what looked like the patients with islet transplantation. So you can see that uh, approximately half, half women and men, a little bit more female, but that's uh, uh, nearly the same. Look at the age. 47 mean, which means that we are not talking about young patients. We're talking about my patients and should be patient in the fourth or fifth decade after a lot of evolution with a very selective group of patients with severe diabetes. Um, typically, they have 30 years history of diabetes because most of them have been diabetic when they were kids. Uh, they are lean. And the rest is, is quite classical. So the analysis plan was we, we wanted to go in this, in this incredible series of data with a clear analysis plan. So the exposure, the, the factor we are looking for is primary graph function defined, as I told you, uh, with this score, this composite score, one month after the last infusion. And then we, we, we analyzed all the covariates that could have an impact on long-term outcome. The, the recipient characteristics, age, BMI, the duration of diabetes, but also uh, the type of immunosuppression, the type of islets they received, everything that we could capture in the database. And what we looked is the outcome, the clinical outcome. I will come back with that. So this is the primary outcome. The primary outcome that we have looked at is called successful islet transplantation. And a successful islet transplantation is someone who has none on this event. So the A1C is always under 7%. There is no severe hypoglycemic episode, and there is C-peptide. So sometimes there's a bit of insulin, but the, 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 overall, um, the overall outcome is very good. So the, the glucose control is good, no, no hypo episodes, and the function is proven. So you can see on this, uh, this slide, so of course it's a worldwide, there is not a single uh, patient missing, so the, the results are what they are, meaning that after five years, you can see that 70% of the patients have lost this successful islet transplantation. You can see the reverse, that 30%, five years, have successful islet transplantation, so which is a perfectly uh, functioning uh, graft uh, five years later. So this is the overall cohort. 
Now we have three other secondary outcomes, so more simple. The one is graft flow. So graft flow is there is any C peptide can be measured in blood, meaning that uh, you can still see that the islet transplanted are functioning. So of course, some patients have an islet functioning. In many cases, this is enough to avoid a severe hypoglycemia episode. But of course, they will need insulin, and some of them will not be com completely controlled. So, but if you look at that, at five years, that means that 42% have lost graft function, so 60% still have a functioning graft. They still have immunosuppression justified by the function of the graft. Uh, let's go directly to insulin needs, which is a, an easy to understand clinical outcome. So the patients in need for insulin uh, is the red, the red curve. So you can see here that 25% uh, at five years have no need for insulin. 76 have returned to the, to the insulin need, some insulin, some of them like before, but many of them a little bit of insulin to just avoid, uh, to just to avoid the hyperglycemia, but with no severe But 25% have no uh, insulin need at all five years later. Uh, okay, so now if we look at uh, this is stats, I don't go to the, to the very detailed statistics, but just to tell you that. Uh, in this uh, very careful uh, statistical analysis, we looked at the impact of the primary graph function. And what we showed here, whatever the four, uh, the four um, outcome we looked at, the impact of primary graph function was very significant. And independently of any other things, what you see one month after transplantations tells you what is going to happen five years later. Meaning that, of course, all these patients are of good immunosuppression. If you stop immunosuppression, of course, you're losing everything. But no patients can stop immunosuppression like that. So all the other factors are impacting, but the most important and the more impacting one is the primary graph function you can measure one month after first transplantation. And this was true with uh, any of these uh, of these uh, of these uh, outcomes. So here it's uh, just. Uh, sub analysis that we were able to show that this was true, either in patients who received only one transplantation or in the group who received multiple transplantation. This does not change anything. So you can have three transplantation, does not tell you anything. What is important is what is the function of islets you're measuring after the last transplantation. If you can do the same with one, this is fine. But if you need two or three, at the end of the day, this is what you have functioning, living islets one, one month after the transplantation will tell you uh, how long you will go. Uh, same here, we just we did this uh, sub-analysis to separate the patients with islet transplantation alone or the patients with islet after kidney transplantation. And again, same result in both two groups. So uh, again, a very strong factor, whatever, uh, whatever group you are looking, this is the most important one. And that means that just not to be too long, but that to be practical, that if you look, it's reachable from the, from the article, if you have a patient and you're one month after the transplantation, you can just plug these four criteria, glycemia, acting C peptide, the need for insulin, and A1C. And with that, you will have an estimate, of course, it's an estimate, but you will have an estimate of what is the chance to have a, a living graft in five years. So you can just estimate the median, uh, the median duration of successful uh, uh, transplantation. So this is something which is important, uh, of course, because you can do something. Because if you have, for example, a first transplantation and you see that the, 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 the expected time of duration is too low, you can put again the patient on the list and, and list him or her for a second transplantation. So they could guide the clinical way you are, you are dealing with transportation. So far, it was just the number of ideas we were putting, but not the actual uh, function. Yeah, so, um, this is report. amazing. This is an amazing um, outcome. I do. There's one question in the chat I just want to address because I know we're pressed for time and we may have a hard stop at 9.30, is for unsuccessful outcomes, what percent have each of the criteria or two or three? 
Alexis Karma, if you want to yeah. unmute yourself and ask that directly. Hi, thanks, Monica. What I was there was a slide that had the unsuccessful outcomes. I was just wondering of those by criteria, the three criteria that you listed for unsuccessful outcome. I wondered what which were the most common, and then did you have several that had all three? Okay, so I, I get your point. So the thing is that uh, you, you have all the details because we have sub analysis in the supplementary material of the article, so you can have the, the precise answer to your question there. But long story short, this is the, the thing. The thing is that these four criteria travels together. There is never a situation where there is no C peptide and, and super good uh, glucose control. So but the thing is that since the doctors are deciding the insulin uh, they put, so if you don't have these four criteria together, it's difficult to judge just because of the glucose control if it's a good function or not. So the idea is that these four criteria goes together. And of course, uh, it's difficult to say that one is more important than others. But if you need to separate one, C-peptide is surely, which is a direct reflect of the, of the islet function. Uh, the C-peptide is the most uh, critical one. Uh, but, but of course, you are more refined and you have better estimate if you have the four criteria. And that's why we use the beta score as the, as the metric. But we could have used, with a little less performance, we could have used only C peptide one month after. But of course, uh, because the patient is different from one from the other, with this level of C peptide, it's important to know if the glucose control is good or optimal. Uh, and this is what gives you the, the best score. Thanks. OK, so that's that's the last question. So the idea is that this is what we were before. So a lot of people were, were looking for these super magic forks, you know, with only one little uh, injection of islets. You can do very good because you would be super good with the immunosuppression. At the end of the day, this is not the case. It is very important to start with enough islets. Let's say that type 1 diabetes plus islet transplantation, plus immunosuppression looks like type 2 diabetes. OK, that means that you have enough islets to control glucose. But if not just enough islet, you will have a decline of function with time. You will have a little bit of hyperglycemia, which will be toxic for the islets. And then at the end, you will decline with time. If you start with very good islets, like a non-diabetic patient or person, and then you will go for, for lifetime. So this is the idea. So it's so far, and it, it is sad that we have to use this the three forks, but uh, this, is, this is what is important. Because if we start with not enough islets, we will give the same expression, so with the same risk for the patients, but of course we will have much less uh, uh, success in the long term. So as, as long as we are, we are transporting patients with this immunosuppression, it is important to ensure that we have enough islets. We can do that with two or three infusion. That's the bad way that sometimes we need. Of course, it would be better to have super isolation, better donors, super cells. So after only one infusion, you have the same results. And maybe, of course, the, the stem cell derived uh, islets will be the answer because here you can just decide you just put more because you are producing the islets. They're not coming from a single donor. So this is an important perspective. So importantly, so there is this both response. So the more you put, the more long-term outcome you will have. Importantly, it's an early predictor of the success. If we do trials, we can have that as an end point. So a proxy to say that we are doing good or better with this other treatment or immunosuppression because we have a better early uh, bilateral function. So we don't have to wait five years to have the results. And of course, as I can tell you just now, this will inform us on the decision. Should we do a second one or a third one, or do we have enough? Even before that, uh, the, full, uh, the full results of one year is, is known, because after one month, we already know if we are on a good track or not. Fantastic. This is a great way to uh, really gather um, sort of predictive medicine um, outcomes, you know, just at the, at the start of the, the implantation. So a great tool, um, for those who are involved in this, the whole EPIDA network, um, as well as, um, others who are interested in the clinical and research, you know, aspect of this. Um, 
if anyone wants to ask a final question, I know uh, Francois is ready to, uh, he's got a hard stop. So if you have any final questions, please reach out to him directly. He's cited on the paper. And um, thank you again for this excellent presentation um, and a phenomenal new paper. Congratulations. Thank you very much, Monica. I enjoyed a lot this, uh, this presentation and it was a very good opportunity to tell you a little bit about this islet transplantation, which is, uh, uh, which is often cited, but it's, it's as, as, as least you, you see it, and you saw the islets coming in the, in the liver, which is uh, important. Okay, well, thank you again for inviting us, and uh, have a nice day there. Thank you very much. Thank you um, so much. Like people will be sending some questions via email, and have a great rest of your day in France. Bye-bye. Do not, do not hesitate. Bye-bye, Monica. Bye-bye, all. Bye. Bye. Bye.